It's OTR in prime time with Vince McMahon. We are all over the question of Stone Cold. Why is he not in the WWE? And what does Vince have that Stone Cold wants that he won't give him? And Bret Hart and Vince McMahon, they met face to face. We'll ask him about that meeting. We got great questions for Vince McMahon, so bring it on. The record with Michael Landsberg is brought to you by the Cake Steakhouse and Bar. For great steaks, good friends, see you tonight. Every three or four years or so, we hook up kind of like uh, an OTR leap year with this man. And anyone who has seen the shows knows that they are intense and unpredictable. Anyone who knows boxing knows that Ali Fraser, the third one, was the very best. Vince McMahon, nice to see you. Thank you very much, Mike. So, are you ready to have some fun? Sure. Why just screw Brett? Why did I screw Brett? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. The biggest star ever uh, in the history, I think, of your sport, certainly in terms of the contribution that he has brought to the bottom line, might very well be Stone Cold Steve Austin. Certainly, um, he probably made you more money than anyone else. You may have done the same with him. Let me ask you this. His contract has expired. He's now at home in Texas. Why is he not on your roster? Um, well, Stone Cold can't physically compete anymore. Uh, and we've known that for a while. Uh, and Steve is one that if he really can't contribute, then he doesn't want to be on the sidelines. He doesn't want to be thought of as less than what he was. This is really Steve's decision, uh, not mine. But isn't part of it that he wants to be thought of as Stone Cold Steve Austin away from wrestling? And you guys are, are in dispute right now over, over the name. Uh, he wants the rights to use his name, and you guys haven't come to an agreement yet. Is that true? Uh, well, without Steve being a, you know, a contracted uh, a performer, you know, then when you're a contracted performer, you have lots of rights and privileges and things of that nature. But as a public company, the, we own the IPO, the intellectual property known as Stone Cold Steve Austin. He owns Steve Austin. So, uh, again, when he's not, you know, it's important for us to protect uh, that intellectual property in terms of Stone Cold Steve Austin. And naturally, he would like to be able to take that and do what it whatever he would want to. And, and that's what happened with The Rock as well, right? And you did come to an agreement, right? Where he actually bought the right to use his name, The Rock, from you. No, that's not true. Okay, that's hey, what, Vince, don't tell me about your business. I know what's going yeah, on. He brought right. the name from you. <laughs> no, and don't correct me, Vince. <laughs> I know. No, that's not what happened, actually. But we did give Rock a license to use the name The Rock uh, for Hollywood and things of that nature. But, Stone uh, Cold, I made a statement. Is, is it true that probably Stone Cold made your company more money than any performer ever? I, would, I, I think that's definitely the case. His success at one time was unbelievably staggering. No question about it. So does he, does he deserve a certain loyalty because of that, given what he brought to the... Especially at a time when, you're, when your company was, was uh, actually below WCW, because you did the show at that time, mm -hmm. and then eventually, within a year and a half, you were kicking their butts, at least in a huge part, because of Stone Cold. Well, certainly Stone Cold contributed, but, you know, I mean... And the, the character Stone Cold had a lot of help. I mean, you just, you just don't have a meteoric rise on your own in our business. I mean, people have to help you get there, and he had a lot of help, and certainly Steve would be the, you know, the first person to tell you that he had a lot of help to get there. So he led the way unquestionably to records that, uh, uh, that he surpassed all of Hogan's records and things of that nature in terms of merchandising and licensing and, and pay-per-view and live events. Without question, the most popular performer we've ever had. Now, you, you have to respond to the public, right, to some extent, because, sure. because I mean, it, it's not brain surgery. to know the public, obviously, is what drives every aspect of your company. How much do you have to listen to a public that must be saying to you all the time, Vince McMahon, we're stone cold? Well, the public isn't saying that. No? No, the public is not saying that. Because the public, they've been telling us. They've been saying, you've got to ask them about Stone Cold. Sure. Well, the public would want to have the Stone Cold Steve Austin that, that they remember. And they would want to have, if you're a baseball fan, Babe Ruth playing uh, you know, in his career at the highest level he possibly could. And that's the Babe Ruth that they would want. They wouldn't want the Stone Cold now who can't perform. He has physical limitations. Would you take him back? Oh, I did everything I could to possibly sign Stone Cold Steve Austin. I gave him a tremendous uh, offer. You know, and he has decided on his own to go out on his own. That's not to say that he won't be back one day. The doors are open. You know, but again, this is Steve's decision. You know, and Steve, you know, is is um, does he owe you willed. something, Vince? Because uh, in a lot of ways, you took him back when he was very troubled, and you welcomed him back into the company when it would have been easy. Now, I'm not saying you didn't make money at that point right. off him, but you could have turned your back on a guy that was kind of dirty for a time. Well, he he walked out on us twice, um, and he was forgiven both times. Um, and it, it hurt the entire company. It hurt all of the performers when you just walk out like that and you leave 
everyone hanging. Um, Steve recognized the error of his ways, and when we got back together, and this last go-round was, was a lot of fun for both of us, but again, the physical limitations that he has, he, he can't compete, so if he can't compete, you can only pretend that he can compete for so long, and the public says, well, how come he's not in the ring, you know? You know so there, and there are other um, you know, production uh, aspects of this that you can only go so far with a character that you can't make the money off of in terms of live events and pay-per-view and whatever and he's taking up space now that some young buck you know might have an opportunity uh, for themselves and we'll discuss that issue because obviously it's all about finding that young buck so are, are you saying to us that as the wrestler we do Stone Cold is done um, I, I, yes, I mean, he definitely is. I mean, there's no question about that. That's not to say that he still doesn't have value to our organization. Because you've used guys in, in, another, in another capacity. Obviously, sure. you flirted that with Mick Foley, uh, right. you know, from time to time, knowing that he couldn't do what he used to do in the right. ring, but there's still a value because of his charisma. Well, you know, Stone Cold will always have value, and when you mention the name Stone Cold, it is like mentioning the name Babe Ruth in Could baseball. Could he cross over? the way The Rock has crossed over, do you think there's, uh, maybe not with that kind of success, but it, it, do you think that, that he could make the leap into another world? Actually, uh, my whole uh, thought of Stone Cold was one that his future was not in the ring any longer. His future really was in film. Uh, and we had a film written for him um, called The Marine. Uh, and that's where we thought Steve's future w was going to be. And uh, but again, it required him signing, you know, an agreement to be with the so company. So he turned it down. So he turned it down, you know. But again, I, I think that in a way, I don't think he can be the Rock, you know. But he was never that type of individual. But I think can Steve do a, a crossover into Hollywood, you know, with the right script? And, and and I think absolutely he could. Do you deal with him one on one, or do you deal with his lawyers and his team? Because I want to compare it to the old days. Because because I, I would imagine you still see yourself as a wrestling guy, as opposed to a businessman wearing a suit. And I how does seen, yeah, I do? So you know. so do you get to deal with him, or is it now all about the lawyers and the agents and the whole team that comes in that negotiates on his behalf? Um, I I much prefer dealing with the talent, uh, straight away, man to man. Um, and naturally, I, I think they should have a representation in terms of their attorneys. Because you want everyone to look over what it is you're doing and, and whatever, and make sure that it's a fair deal and, and and whatever. But at the same time, when an attorney who knows nothing about your business tries to tell you, well, this guy needs this, he needs that, and these are totally unreasonable requests, uh, it, it sours the relationship. You know, there's no doubt about that. You know, and that was actually the case with Stone Cold as well. His attorney was one that um, I did not get along with at all. I told him so. You know, you know me. I'm a big mouth. If I don't like you, I'm going to tell I you. I believe that, you know? Vince. I do. No. <laughs> I don't think you'd hold anything back. So we're warmed up and ready to go. We got to talk about some Canadians, right? Okay. Good. We got to talk to, uh, but Chris Jericho, right? Good Canadian boy from Tampa. Well, uh, we'll from talk Tampa. about that when OTR returns. <laughs> Off the record with Michael Landsberg is brought to you by the Keg Steakhouse and Bar for great steaks, good friends. See you tonight. So you got this great roster of talent, Vince McMahon, led in a large part by Canadians. I mean, right. you have this huge representation of Canadians from all across this country. And then someone tunes into one of your shows and they hear Chris Benoit from Atlanta. Now, guys like me and probably a half million others watching this show get upset about that. Well, why did you do that and do you regret it? Because I know you changed back. Uh, well, we really have a change back. You know, Because uh, you don't regret it then? Yeah. Well, I, I think this, that, that when Chris Benoit became world champion, Chris, of course, had been living in the States for well over 10 years and living in Atlanta. Uh, so don't look at me that way. Well, I'm looking you at know, you this so, way. It doesn't matter so, whether he's living there. He's only living there because it's convenient. But he's from Canada. Well, he's living there because he prefers it, doesn't no, he? No, I, I, I don't. He's the Canadian crippler. I know, right. I mean, look, it's okay for a Canadian to live in America. I mean, I think that's fine. I wasn't it's, looking for permission. It's, I mean, it's I, all right for I, an I don't American want to live, to live in, in your country, country, but that's okay. I, mean, well, I wouldn't mind living in Canada. I like it up here. It's wait, great. Wait till uh, April 30th. That's tax day. Oh, you won't like it so much. Okay. No. Okay, so Chris Benoit right. from uh, Atlanta, right? right? Chris Jericho from. Well, New no, York now residing in Atlanta. Edge not, from Tampa. We're not. We're not. We're not saying the Edge is from Toronto. But you weren't trying to be factually correct, Vince. You I weren't saying. Not. Well, you weren't trying to be factually correct and going. Well, I mean, technically, these people are living in those cities, so we have to be true to to where they're no, residing. I, I really no. I was using that, you know, as as a way to increase their popularity in the states. 
not the fact that they're transplanted Canadians, you know, and they're living, you know, they could have hanged my hat on the fat, fact that most of them live in Tampa or, or that Benoit's lived in, in Atlanta for over 10 years. Why is Christian could, from Toronto? Christian's a heel. Oh, so it's, so it's, you know, so that's what it's about. It's, it's all, it's, it's, about, it's, it's about the work. It's about the popularity, you know, of a performer. Why can't we be good guys, there, Vince? Well, you can, but there's a bias in the United States in terms of uh, Canadians. I dare say there's a bias in Canada in terms of those from the United States, but not as strong. Does that date back to the Hart Foundation and, and uh, all of what that brought? Which I, I still, to this day, when we talk to Bret Hart about it, and he and I have gotten to be pretty good friends through the show. I don't like dropping names, but he's a guy that I feel... A, no, it, it's true. I feel a ton of warmth for him. He says the greatest time in his life in terms of wrestling was that period of time. Right. It was a good time. Right. And you know, so it still goes back to that, the fact that, you know, making the Canadian the heel is a good thing. Uh, and conversely, when you come over here to Canada, a lot of the, you know, the baby faces, Americans, are heels in terms of Canada, depending on if they're working with Canadians or not. So what do you say to Canadian fans who love Chris Benoit, the Canadian crippler? I would say continue to love him. You know, we certainly don't hide the fact that he was, you know, born in Montreal, grew up in Edmonton. You know, we're, we're proud of that. You're a smart man, Vince. No, you're no I'm not. To, you're trying to show, hey, no, I, know, really. I know where he's from. You know, but, but we don't hide that fact. I mean, he is. He's probably uh, from, from Edmonton, we'll tell you so, in every interview that you ever do. So if he's now residing in Atlanta, which he is, that's factual at the same time. In the image of the biased American, you know, it helps Benoit's image. Bret Hart, you know where he's living? Yes, I do. He's living in Calgary, and you know that, of course, because the Hart family is unbelievably well known, and you know that family, and you've uh, you, but you visited him, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yeah, tell me about your meeting because I, I've I've heard some stuff, and I want you to tell me as it relates to wrestling, of course. Um, well, it was really nice to to, to meet with Brett. Uh, my son Shane and I did. Uh, Brett was uh, an hour late for the meeting, which is Brett style. He was watching uh, the Flames. You know, of course, we were too, but I didn't tell him that when he arrived an hour late. I said, "Where the hell have you been?" You know, uh, he's well. I got caught in traffic. I was a little bit late. You know, I was watching the flames. So it was really good to see Brett. You know, and and Brett and I at one time were very very close. I'd like to think that we still are. Uh, and but he hated you in between the time you were close and where you are now, yeah, right? I, I think he probably did. You know, I don't. Oh the, no, he did. You know, the feeling. The <laughs> no, feeling he, he did. I oh, mean, this good. is not probably. Right. He hated you. Well, you know what? If you hate someone, I think you have to care. You know, I, if, if you, oh, he would be the if, first to admit that, Vince, that he, he could only hate you because you were so close and you meant so much to his right. life. And he felt betrayed by you. Right. And, and that's really unfortunate. It was an unfortunate time in my life, an unfortunate time in Brett's life. Uh, and, you know, I, I'd like to apologize if I could for that situation. But I, I find myself in a situation of, look, would I do that all over again? I probably would. You know, so an apology would would not be the right thing to do, certainly opening my arms and, you know, for the company and for, for all of Brett's fans to say, Brett, come back in some capacity, even if it's a, you know, a one night honoring Brett, it's something we'd like to do. We're, we're contemplating putting out a, a CD like we did on Ric Flair and so forth with Brett Hart, you know, and we want Brett to help us out with that. And that was one of the purposes of the meeting and Brett said he would. You know, Brett's legacy is extraordinary, and, and it's part of the fabric of WWE, and we applaud that, even though Brett and I haven't always gotten along, and Brett at one time perhaps hated my guts, as you say. And it's fair to say that uh, his popularity in this country could never be questioned. He's a Canadian hero, right? No question about it. Yes! I did it! Because I threw it out the first time we were on the show, and I said he's a Canadian hero, and you disagreed with that, well, because you said he's a WWF hero at the time. And also a Canadian one. Okay. I'm just having fun with you. But it's, it would be hard to start a relationship with a guy when you said, if I could do it all over again, I'd screw you again. Because it was, obviously it was good for business. Well, at least you know, well, not necessarily good for business. I don't know if it was good for business. You look back on it, and it was. You know, because you, you capitalized right on that brilliantly, though. Mm -hmm. the, uh, it, like the legacy to me of Vince McMahon more than anything would be after you walked out of the Survivor Series in Montreal, you turned what could have been a PR nightmare to a huge positive. You built that as a huge storyline. Yes, I mean, why not? I mean, you know, as a flexible human being and a flexible businessman, you have to go with, you know, what conditions are. Conditions change sometimes beyond anything you have to do with them, and you either rock with them or, or you die. So we agree then, Canadian hero, Bret Hart. Canadian hero. Vince McMahon, more in a moment.
Vince McMahon, you are associated more than any other human being with wrestling. Yet you're sitting here, and I actually notice maybe a little different tone in your voice. You talk a little bit more corporate because because now you run a public company, right? right. You have you have shareholders that you're beholden to. Have you changed? Do you like the change? Is it is it important for you to be taken seriously in the huge genre called business? Um, I, I think it's important to be taken seriously um, as an entertainment company, uh, and and we are that, uh, and we have wound up to be the the only entertainment company of its kind uh, still in existence and flourishing. Uh, so, I think yes, you know, from a serious standpoint, it's a serious business. You know, it's also still and always will be a fun business, and it's something that you you have to do with passion. You know, and, and a degree of, of levity. Does it bother you that that there are people though that that because it's wrestling, mm -hmm. they don't give it its due in the business sense. They look at it and they say, well, it's wrestling, and they don't understand that you have taken your company to places that guys who run major studios perhaps have never gone. But they look at it somehow that there's something wrong with it. It's dirty. That it's valued less because it's wrestling. Does that piss you off? Um, yes, it does. You know, candidly, it does. In every opportunity that I have, I try to correct all of that. So correct me. Well, I mean, I wasn't saying that, sure. but that's what people think. Well, I don't think that's what people think. I think that's what some people think, you know, and, and, you know, pretty much narrow-minded individuals. Um, but when you, you know, our goal is to be uh, as good as we possibly can be in all respects. We're concerned uh, with our image. We're concerned, as any public company would be, we're concerned with our product. We're mostly concerned with our fans. So, and I think that we're closer to our fans than any other entertainment company. We listen to them almost on a nightly basis when we're performing. What do they like? What do they dislike? Uh, and, and of course, the, the, the one sound that, that speaks louder than any other is silence. Because if they don't care, we're in trouble. Amen to that. You know. How's your health? My health is fantastic. I asked that for a question, not that I don't care, because of course I do care about your you're health. You're going to challenge me to a wrestling I'm match. I'm not going to challenge gonna you to right? a wrestling match, but I'd be okay because it's fake anyway, right? <laughs> oh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least the result would be determined ahead of time. Right. It would look like you were beating me, then I'd come back to beat you. But my question for that is that if I was a shareholder in your company, right. one of the biggest concerns I would have would be your health and your longevity. Because if, if you disappear, God forbid, mm -hmm. to me, you are wrestling. How does the company survive without you? Well. It survives because of, of my son Shane, my, my daughter Stephanie, and, and my son-in-law Triple H, and the extraordinary corporate staff that we've And your future grandchild. Well, yes. Or not your, your grandchild, Grandpa. but your, yes. your grandchild taking it over, right? Yes. Three months old? <laughs> Three months old. Um, and, you know, there are succession plans built in. You know, I mean, my lifestyle I could, I could kick tomorrow, I doubt it. You know, I'm, I'm healthy as a horse. You know, bodybuilding is my hobby, always has been. You know, so I'm very healthy. and. Um, I think I have many more years of, uh, of contributions, and I love what I do. This so if is, you were to decide work. all of a sudden, you know what, I, I'd like to do something else, and you walked out the door, who would run the company? Um, well, it would be a number of individuals that run the company because no Your kids are watching now going, please say me, please yeah, say I know, me. I know, but, but for instance, I do a lot of jobs, you know, and, and wear a lot of hats. I, I recognize that, that after I'm gone, no one individual is going to wear as many hats as I wear. You know, I mean, and the company has grown to the extent that really it would almost be impossible for any one individual to do that without failing. You know, so whereas in terms of the creative staff and things of that nature and my contributions there, that would be one individual doing that. In terms of the corporate standpoint, it would be another individual doing that. So uh, there are at least two, two people who would do my job. What would Triple H do? What would his, what would his, uh, his role be in the big picture of the company now? Because, I mean, he's your son-in-law. Uh, well, first of all, he's very bright, you know, and has a great deal of common sense and, and good business sense as well. So I can't say specifically other than, obviously, you know, his contributions as a talent and understanding talent, understanding production, television production as well, and how it all blends together to make stars. Surely he could have enormous contributions that way, which is the heartbeat of the business. Same with Stephanie right now in terms of you know, she's in charge of the creative staff. So Stephanie has been at my right hand for so long and whatever. And, and at, at first when she first came on, I wasn't too sure she was going to grasp it. And then, wow, she just you know, really has a tremendous understanding of it now. And the storytelling aspect of what we do, you can have two great athletes, be they boxer, wrestler, whatever it may be, but if there's no story between them, then the public really doesn't just care. Just men in underwear. 
Exactly. Now, women in underwear is a different story, <laughs> but men in underwear isn't intriguing for many of us. Vince McMahon will take a break. As we go to break, we, uh, we always ask the audience for their thoughts, and this is for you, Vince. Hey, Vince, what were you thinking when Kurt told you he wanted to wrestle Brock at WrestleMania 19? Don't answer that now. We'll answer that when Off the Record returns. We always try to respond, and this is for Vince, of course, as well. Why would anyone ask me a question? Hey, Vince, how do you plan to beef up the SmackDown roster? It's looking thinner than Hulk Hogan's hairline. We'll talk about that when OTR returns. Your hair looks good, though. Thank you. I got to say thank you to Vince McMahon. Thanks for doing the show. But, but also, your show and what you brought to our show, I should say, has been hugely responsible for the success of Off the Record because your roster was available to us right off the bat. All of a sudden, guys were talking from the heart, and, and it wasn't right. all at work. And it was sure. uh, one of the huge things for Off the Record. So thanks for that. It's a good contribution. Uh actually for us as well. Excellent. Thanks for saying that as well. Now that we've got the niceties out of the way. Right. Uh, Hulk Hogan. Um, I want to talk about this in the next show because this is part one. How's your relationship with him? Good. Goldberg? Good. But neither one of those guys is working for your company, then, right? No. Uh, no, they're not. Um, matter of fact, I got a message uh, from Hogan recently uh, without him contacting me personally. Uh, and that was, uh, tell Vince, you know, that uh, I'm training, I feel better than I've ever felt in my life. Uh, he had a hip operation, it was successful, uh, and he's squatting now with, uh, uh, being a co-bodybuilder, squatting now with more weight than he's ever had, and he's ready to come back. Did he say the message really slow, the way he wrestles? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and uh, Lesnar and Angle, did you like the thought of that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, that's, you know, when you just when you conjure up the image of those extraordinary Pretty athletes. Pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Vince, i got to cut you off. We'll see you part two with Vince McMahon, the man who is Don't wrestling. cut me off. Yeah, I'll do it when I want. Ah. Off the Record with Michael Landsberg is brought to you by the Keg Steakhouse and Bar. For great steaks, good friends, see you tonight. Michael Landsberg's clothing provided by Victorinox, Swiss Army, Available at Sporting Life in Toronto and better specialty stores across Canada. It's off the record, part two of our exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with Vince McMahon. We'll get inside his head. What was he thinking when Kurt Angle said, I'll wrestle in WrestleMania 19 with a broken neck? Plus, Hulk Hogan and Bill Goldberg, what are their futures, if any, in the WWE? And his answer is on steroids will shock you, so bring it on. Off the Record with Michael Landsberg is brought to you by the Cake Steakhouse and Bar. For great steaks, good friends, see you tonight. You know, I'm counting them up, and Vince McMahon, you have been on Off the Record one, two, once with your wife, that's three, four times as of yesterday, and five today. Do you not take me seriously? Sure, I take you seriously. Well, yeah, and Shane and Stephanie were on the show. It's like, oh, you know, we can get good times. Let's go on Off the Record. We well, do ask the tough questions. This is a good time. Okay, well, you know what? What's a good time for you is going to be a good time for me. WrestleMania number 19. Kurt Angle needs, uh, he needs neck surgery, right? Right. He's, he's quite injured at this point. Neck surgery is not something to be looked at frivolously. And he comes to you and says, I want to wrestle. What did you think at the time? Um, first of all, the, it's difficult for a competitor like Kurt to get him to tell you the truth. Because more times than not, they will conceal injuries because we know that we won't let them work if they're hurt. Um, and Kurt uh, has a habit of doing that, and we're trying to, it's an old school, you know, machismo kind of a thing to do, and it's like, no, 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 I, you know, I, I can wrestle hurt, and sometimes you can, you know, many times you can. But this is really hurt, really, this is we're hurt. talking, you know, life-threatening injury here. Sure, right. So, so when he came to you and said, I, I want to do it, I want to wrestle, did at least part of you say to yourself, I can't let him do that? Sure, you know, and, and you discuss it with Kurt, you discuss it with his doctor. You know, and you see what, you know, what sort of condition we were faced with uh, and whether or not you should go through with it. And it's always a very delicate, you know, uh, question and answer session you have with yourself. Sometimes you say no. Sometimes you take a chance when someone has so much passion like Kurt, you know, and you try to rule out in our business, you know, you try to rule out, okay, but, but don't do this and don't do that, you know, in terms of uh, crazy moves in which you may wind up on your head, you know, and... Um, 
actually in, in, in that particular so match. So you look back on that because it's hard not to listen to you talk right now and think, you know what? Just didn't care enough about a guy who, who literally could have been crippled for life. When you look that, back at it, that's not true because why? Oh, well, just credit me being a good businessman. Even if you assume, assume that I don't care anything at all about you personally, you know. But if you credit me as being a good businessman, I have value built into these performers and these characters. Long-term value. I want to get long-term value out of them. I can't do that if they're crippled and can't compete or, or can't in some way be on the show. So that'd be a stupid decision. One of the on problems part. that you have though is getting long-term out of guys now, right? Because because the, the stunts are so great and the sport that people say is fake is anything but fake. And, and and you look at guys and they come and go. I mean, Stone Cold. What six years ago he was on the top. He was he was selling a million T-shirts right. a month, and now he can't wrestle anymore because what you do is damn violent. Uh, what we do takes a toll on your body. There's no question about that. You know, and you know, it um, a number of concussions, which is one of the things we have to worry about all the time. You know, back problems, neck problems, um, things of that nature. It it comes with you know with what you what it is we do for a living, and you either accept that going in, you know, or don't get in it. Because a guy like Brock Lesnar, for instance, you're talking about stars and the value of long term. This is a guy that, that could have had a huge long term value, right? He, he was a guy that looked like you built him in a computer. You I said, know, okay, right. I want to have a wrestler right. who's the next big one. And you looked at him and you say, this guy is absolutely perfect. Right. But now he's gone. And one of the reasons is that, that he didn't like the life and the toll that it took on his life. Uh, I think Brock's concern was not so much the physical toll that it took on him, uh, the, the traveling and things of that nature. Brock uh, did not like being around people uh, as, as, and did what did not, he, how did he phrase that to you? He just doesn't you know, enjoy that. He's really an introvert. You know, and you'll find a lot of amateur wrestlers really are introverts. And, and Brock's an introvert. You know, it was tough to get him to be you know, one of his problems with his, was with his verbal skills in the initial stages because he, you, know, you have to be able to speak. You have to have a certain amount of charisma. You know, and he was just being able to really to grasp all of that when he decided to go play pro football. How crazy is it though when a guy says, you know, the lifestyle is, takes its toll so much on me as, as a wrestler, I'm going to play football in the NFL because it's easier on my body. How crazy right. is that? It's pretty, uh, it's pretty wild, you know, and especially uh, you know, what, what, what he had already put into the business in terms of his contributions and his investment. He was just about ready you know, to reap some benefit from that. You know, he wasn't always a, a box office attraction, and he really was just becoming a box office attraction. So it was... Um, it was hurtful to our company. You know, you, again, you can't make someone perform for you, even though you have a contract with them. Did you when he came to you? Yes, it was. I mean, it was like, I, you, you want to do what? You know, and he said, yes. You know, he said, you know, I, I did know that he had an opportunity or was contemplating playing pro ball or coming here when he came out of college. We drafted him to come here. And, and, and I thought that's really what he wanted because he said that's what he wanted. Um, but I guess maybe the, the longing of, uh, of, of his athletic career wanted him to, to try football or whatever, and that's what he's doing. Vince, do you worry that, that you, you throw the bar out there and you tell your guys, let's keep raising the bar, mm -hmm. but that bar sometimes is a ladder, and it's a guy like Edge, and he keeps climbing up the ladder higher and higher and higher, and each time he jumps off the ladder, people give a bigger gasp, because you've got to keep going up higher and higher. You mean that literally? I mean that literally. Okay, no, we don't do that. Because, and and w was, was that because you scaled back, because you said to yourself, these guys will literally kill themselves in the ring because it's exciting for them, it's why they got into the business? If you allow, them, allow themselves, they would definitely, unrealistically, put their life on the line. And, and you have to, as a producer, you have to be able to say, wait a minute, I have a vested interest, and again, as a businessman. And again, if you assume I, did, I didn't care about them, which I do, I've become very close to all of these guys. I'm like a father figure to a lot of them. You know, and, and, I, and I, you have to draw the line, you have to say, no, we're just not doing that anymore. And it's a huge problem for you now, given what guys do in the ring, because the guys that, that you were hoping would be your next stars are getting hurt, right? Kurt Angle? Right. You know, Lesnar and, you know, Stone Cold, you've already said, is gone now. Right. It's tough to, I mean, if a studio says, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get Tom Cruise and we're going to have him for the next 40 years, that can happen. But it doesn't seem like you can have a guy now for 40 years because it no. takes its toll. It does take its toll. You know, and it's important for us always to have um, the emerging star. And, and, and that's the way our business really has always been. And it's important for the John Cena's to come along now and the Eddie Guerrero's and the Chris Benoit's who they've who had their, their injuries as well in the past. And, but yet they're veterans, you know, but now they're, they have bright futures ahead of them.
you look at two of those guys, Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit, they both came from WCW. Yes. Was it not healthy at one time to have them at least there to produce some talent that you could put on your roster? Uh, unquestionably, it was healthy to have WCW as a competitor when they were good competitors, yes. I want to talk to you about the pressure that Cena must feel now to be the next star. Uh, WCW and uh, what you were just saying there and uh, lots more. Maybe you wish you hadn't done the WCW deal. We'll Maybe. talk about that when OTR returns. Off the Record with Michael Landsberg is brought to you by the Keg Steakhouse and Bar. For great steaks, good friends, see you tonight. I got to ask you about WCW. I'm sorry to cut you off from that very Imagine compelling that. story <laughs> during commercial. Actually, I wasn't sorry at all. But WCW, you went out and you bought the competition, right? And it's, that's obviously a business strategy that that almost every business has looked at. Well, no, I, I mean, I didn't buy the competition. I mean, the competition was going out of business. Right. Okay. And Ted Turner, which I never thought would ever happen. I thought Ted would always be a competitor of ours. Ted folded his tent with uh, Time Warner in the wrestling business, and then it was like, well, wait a minute. There's this asset sitting there. You know, so yes, I acquired the asset. Do you wish that the WCW was still alive? I'm not going to say alive and well, right. but still alive and there. Because one of the things that, that you're finding a huge challenge is you have two television shows now a week, right? Mm -hmm. That you have to staff with, with superstars. Right. And it's tough to get that many. But if the other guys are still competing, you can draw people from their roster. And we already mentioned Guerrero and Benoit. Sure. It is more difficult, without exception. Do you wish, do you wish maybe they were still around? Yes, I do. And because there's talk, right, that Turner wants to come back and wants to get back into the business? I would doubt that very seriously, you know, the, at least not on this level. You know, if he wants to get back in the business, uh, like a TNA, I think it's called, le level, he, certainly anyone could do that. To get back into business on this level, uh, is the, the startup costs are extraordinary. Uh, and, and as Ted found out, you know, I mean, this is, this is not just a fly-by-night kind of a investment, you know, and you don't always have a return on your investment, nor did Ted have a return really on WCW, so and the cost it continues to escalate each and every year because we invest more in our product. You see more of it on the screen. You see more of it at live events. When you compete on that level, it, it, the cost is astronomical to come into this business. How worried are you about the injection of new talent? Because the SmackDown roster, for instance, most would say is thin, and the ratings I think have reflected that. How concerned are you about generating new big superstars that the public wants? I'm always concerned about that. You know. I think that uh, you know, with Eddie Guerrero and John Cena as being anchors, really, you know, and Kurt Angle as well, a healthy Kurt Angle, uh, being anchors for the SmackDown brand, that's a really good uh, base to build upon, you know. And we and we will do that. We'll build upon you know new stars. There'll be a number of them coming out to SmackDown. Well, you're talking about new stars. You mentioned John Cena. How about an old star, Hulk Hogan? Because you know his time has come and gone sure. once again with the WWE. How many times is that? Where he's here, he's not here, he's retired, he's <laughs> right. not retired. I mean, right. you mentioned in the last show that you actually got a phone call from him saying, you know, a brother I didn't get the phone call. Again. It was for someone else to relay a message from him. That's because we can't get through. I called you yesterday. <laughs> I never heard back from you, Vince. I always get back to my phone calls, each and every one of them. Um, but, you know, as far as Hogan's concerned, you know, I, I would think that, um, that uh, Hogan would be a candidate for perhaps this year's uh, Hall of Fame. You know, we're going to be out in uh, WrestleMania. Uh, it's going to be in Los Angeles this coming year. So, I mean, I think that... Is it done with you guys, you and Hulk? Do you think as, as, uh, as a guy on your roster? Um, other than the, the exceptional one-off type thing, I, I think it definitely is. Because, again, it's like you, you consider the investment factor. You know, Hogan's a big star. If you bring him back, he's going to want to have a lot of time, you know, for his startup and everything. And it's, it's no different than why you don't see Mr. McMahon, my character, on television anymore. You know, I, I much prefer the other side of the camera anyhow in producing and directing and, and working with talent and motivating them because if my character is out there as a talent, what do you, what's the return on the investment? You know, I'm 58 years old, you know. I mean, going through the motions of what I would be doing in the ring, the physicality, I enjoy that, but, you know, I mean, what's the return on the investment? You get one pay-per-view out of it, you know, and no live events, you know what I mean? So Take us back to Hulk, Vince. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, people want to know what happened last time. Why do you leave? Uh, Hogan, I think it was pretty basic. He did not like his payoff at WrestleMania and said that was it. Didn't want to do the job? Um, I don't think that was it so much. You know, again, I think it was a monetary issue. He's a businessman. Was he supposed to job the big show and he didn't want to do it? 
because he has the reputation, right, of doing what's good for, for Hulk. And, you know, you certainly can't, you, you can't condemn him from the aspect that he's built himself, you know, this massive franchise called Hulk Hogan. But, sure, but he has a reputation in the business of not doing for others what they did for him. Yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I think that's deserved. Uh, unquestionably, sometimes it's not deserved. Is that I mean, what happens with him, with uh, or what happened with him with Big Show? I don't recall that incident, quite frankly. It could very well have been. You know, you know I mean, when guys say they don't recall on the witness stand, people just think they don't want to answer. The yeah, I know that, but I just don't recall. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, this isn't the witness stand. Right. So Hulk could be uh, could have limited representation in your company, but his his job as uh, as a big star is gone. How about Goldberg? Um, again, uh, Goldberg uh, had a tremendous impact. Uh, when he came, he was here for a year. We knew that it was a, a pricey situation when he came over. I heard you didn't like his contract from the time you signed him. Is that true? Uh, no, if I didn't like it, I wouldn't have signed it. You know, it was a bit of a risk, you know, uh, as it were. But nonetheless, it, his con uh, contributions were everything that we thought they would be. So you got what you wanted, what you hoped for out of Goldberg? I think because so. Because he was supposed to be a guy who would really inject a lot of life in the company. Um, yes, and, and he did. You know, and again, it was a one-year deal, and, and we, again, reserved the right to open the door if Bill would ever want to come back, and we'd want him back, you know, to do some one-off stuff. I don't think he, Bill doesn't enjoy the day-to-day -day aspects of the business, you know, in terms of being on the road and things of that nature. And, and again, it's an investment factor. Who are you going to invest your money in? Someone who, you know, doesn't enjoy it and doesn't want to, you know, contribute a full-time schedule, or someone, some up-and-coming star who, who, who you can get your investment out of. So it becomes a business decision. See, I'm interested because you, you talk about uh, Goldberg and you talk about Brock, about how they found the lifestyle difficult. Is that is part of that because they're not wrestlers? They're guys who came from something else to become wrestlers. That the guys who understand and lived and breathed and grew up with wrestling understand that it, it's not, you know, once a week. Right. It's three, four times a week, and this right. is the commitment you got to bring. I think that's fair. You know, again, I, I think that you know the ones that have the longevity here, you know, are, are the individuals who 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 grow up as, as a child, loving and, and emulating and wanting to be a superstar in the WWE. No, no, I, no, no, no. We've got to take a break. Uh, I want to talk about steroids because I, I want to talk to you about how they relate to baseball and what you would do with Barry Bonds when OTR returns. <laughs> Vince McMahon, you don't watch off the record even though we send you our tapes on a daily basis. You don't know that we've been critical of Bud Selig. We don't think he's doing a great job as commissioner of baseball. How many suits you got? Not that many. Not enough to be the commissioner? I think you do. I think you're dodging. If I made you commissioner of baseball right now, how would you handle Barry Bonds and the stigma that he has to deal with right now, which is Babe Ruth talent, Babe Ruth statistics, but people look at him and say, eh, he's juiced. Um, I don't know. I, I think that the... Uh Commissioner of baseball, and it depends on how seriously you take baseball. You know how seriously. I imagine you take he sport. probably takes it pretty seriously. Well, it's I, mean, his job. I, I think he should. You know, but I mean, I think that 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 he, in all likelihood, is somewhat conflicted, giving his back background as an owner and whatever. I, I think the commissioner of baseball is someone who probably loves the sport, uh, loves the game itself, but someone who has impeccable integrity in the past and someone who would look at this from an objective standpoint and do the right thing you know for the integrity of the sport and i think that's what the commissioner of baseball really i think that's more than anything else more than contract with networks and things of that nature i think the commissioner of baseball and all likelihood is charged with that the integrity of the sport so what do you do with barry bonds because because uh, until until someone takes a vial and they watch him test it and they say he's clean or he's not or whatever people don't know what to make of this guy and and you've of course you've dealt with you know the steroid stigma for sure. a long long time well, i think there are a lot of ways to skin a cat you know i mean uh, if you're commissioner of baseball i think i would certainly call barry bonds uh, you know not just to the stand but i would call him to the testing facility and say okay no we're going to test you and we're going to test you on a for the integrity of the sport and for your own personal integrity you know, and if he refuses testing, then you take action. You know, if he doesn't refuse and he passes the test, then, then you can say to the, to the rest of the world, hey, look, this guy is everything that he says he is, and, he, and he's clean, so get off his keister. How do you deal with your own roster from that standpoint? From a standpoint of steroids? Yes. We don't test anymore. Why? Um, well, it's expensive which is a bit of a cop-out because I could afford it these days. I was going to mention that. You know, thank you. <laughs> but that, um, no, that it was a cop-out. Oh. 
But I think the reason we don't test for steroids, we're performers, we're entertainers. You know, uh, we're not cheating anyone. If we're cheating anyone, we're cheating ourselves, unlike baseball or the Olympics or something like that, because when you use steroids, that's an advantage. You're cheating, there's no doubt about it. You know, and if Barry Bonds is using them, you know, he's cheating. I'm not saying that he is using them, but if he is. So I, we're not cheating anyone except ourselves if, in fact, we're doing that. The problem that you have is that um, if I'm a young guy watching, I want to look like those guys. They look pretty damn good. Uh, some of them do, some of them don't. We, all, we have all different body types and so forth, and a lot of times guys would take steroids not because they want to look good, but because it helps them their injuries heal quicker or whatever. That's up to those individuals and their physician, their personal physician. You know, but hopefully we don't have juice heads walking around, you know, uh, and, and I don't think we do. You calling me a juice head? <laughs> no, I'm not. Okay, I just wanted yeah. to check. <laughs> no, I'm not. FCC is all over some guy's ass. I mean, Howard Stern's dealing with that right now. Yeah. Even Oprah's dealing. They're not on you. It shouldn't be. Are you not dangerous enough now, though? Because they used to be the first guy. Top of the list, hit list. There's Vince right. McMahon. There's the WWE. Well, we were wrongfully placed there to begin with. You know, I mean, you know, when you think about some of the things we've done. Well, you done, love that stuff, right? Um, I love some of it. You know, I, mean, I, I do enjoy controversy, of course. Uh, and I, you know, I'm a fighter. I, you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, naturally, you know, pugilistic or whatever. You know, I mean, I, that, that I enjoy the fight. You know, but as far as the FCC is concerned, we, there's nothing about our show now that's uh, that's really Does objectionable. Does that concern you though? Because I mean, the thing that WCW, WWF, right? This, right. and then DX, and then Stone Cold, and sure. all of that, and all of the angles, and all of a sudden, you put them out of business, and you guys put a billion dollars in your pocket. So, so it was the danger that made you so special, and now no one's concerned about the danger. Doesn't that well, concern you? You know, again, when you're competing, you know, as we were, we were burning the candle at both ends. So was Turner. It was a question of who was going to burn out the quickest. You know, since we understand the business, we thought they would, and they did. Do you miss that time? The renegade? I mean, you, you guys really, I mean, talk about walking the line. You crossed the line all the time. Do you miss sure. that time? Um, no. I enjoy the time. You know, I enjoy all the times. I enjoy this time. You know, I, I enjoy all the times of my life, whatever it may be. You know, but I think that, I think that we can have a better business, you know, by, by having... Uh, intricate stories by having better athletes, by having better human beings uh, on our roster. You know what you're talking like? You're not business. talking like a parent. You're talking like a grandparent, which is a beautiful segue to this email for you. Hey, Vince, how does it feel to be a grandfather? Uh, it's so wonderful. Again, uh, you know, I'm the luckiest man in the world. You know, no one comes close to me. You know, I, you know, again, it's like I have a healthy, you know, uh, a business, you know, that I love and passionate about. Uh, I, I have family members around me that are healthy and, and in the business as well. You know, I have a grandson now. I mean, it's like, oh, come on, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I couldn't complain about anything, and I shouldn't. What's your grandson's name, by the way, as we welcome Vince McMahon back off the record? Declan. It's an Irish name. And, and, yeah, a good Irish name. Oh, Very yes. nice. And a, and a good Irishman you are for doing off the record. Thank you. Let me ask you a couple of names, and I'll throw them out there, and you just give me a reaction. Okay. Kevin Nash. Good guy. Sense of humor. Scott Hall. Um, I guess maybe the, the thing that comes to, to Scott when you first meet is drugs, you know, and that's unfortunate, you know, because he kind of threw his career away and his life away because of drugs. Lex Luger. Um, a, a bit of an egotist. Sting. Don't know him at all. I've had just a couple of telephone conversations. He's going to come back? Um, I doubt he'll come back uh, to our organization. Mm -hmm. Again, um, the investment factor. I'd rather invest in younger individuals. Paul Heyman. Uh, clever. Really clever? Clever. I'm just going to let that sink in for a right. second. <laughs> Uh, you are in southern Ontario because you're, you're talking about your next, uh, your pay-per-view in August. Tell me about it, SummerSlam. Uh, SummerSlam, August 15 at the Air Canada Centre. Uh, we've had two WrestleManias uh, in Toronto, and this is the first opportunity to have a SummerSlam. And um, it's, it's the biggest event we do all summer long, so it really should be exciting. What's next for your business? Because, you know, uh, corporations, they got to grow right. or they're dying, right? I agree with How that. How do you grow your business? We grow our business uh, on an international basis. We grow our business with, uh, we have a, a SVOD a platform now called 24-7 that we're introducing. 
which allows us to go back and, and watch the Bret Hart matches and, and some of the old timers, not that Bret's an old timer. You trying to get over with the Canadian audience? Here no, 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 no. I no, think no. you are. Well, maybe I am a little bit. <laughs> uh, I try to get over with every audience. Right. Um, and sometimes I fail miserably. That must be a challenge in Thailand. Uh, yeah. You mentioned I, a great Thai wrestler. <laughs> no, you get over in different ways. Uh, but to me, it, at this 24-7 allows us to go back and take a look at all the archival footage and so forth that we have. and. You know, and some of the marketing of some of the old timers, superstar Billy Graham, Bruno Sammartino, Ivan Putzky, all those wonderful. That sounds awesome. Yeah. I got to cut you off, but I got to say thank you very much. Uh, you're a gentleman, and I respect the fact that you'll come here and sit and talk about wrestling and life with us. Vince McMahon, thank, you. thank you. Pleasure. Off the record with Michael Landsberg is brought to you by the Keg Steakhouse and Bar. For great steaks, good friends, see you tonight. Michael Landsberg's clothing provided by Victorinox, Swiss Army. Available at Sporting Life in Toronto and better specialty stores across Canada. No, but I should know.